All right, we're live. <clears throat> Welcome to the Pistons Talk podcast on YouTube. I'm your host, Lance Caparossi. Follow me on Twitter, at Lance Caparossi. My co-host is Anthony. You can follow him if you don't already on Twitter and all social media platforms, at Pistons Talk. He started the brand. I jumped on the wagon. Anyway, let's get this started. For sure. Um, Our favorite player, Bojan, has passed Tony Kukoc and became the NBA's all-time leading scorer from Croatia. And I believe he's like 168 points away from 10,000. Number the here's the thing I didn't even know they kept a list like this, so I want to know like what other countries are out there and not uh, what other countries are out there, but like what the all time leading scores are from every country. So, but cool for Bojan. Yeah, for sure. Like I, I thought of like uh, Dirk Nowinski because he's like from Germany, and I believe he had like what twenty five thousand points or probably more. I, I'm like I said, don't fact check me. Um, you know, it's probably more because I'm an idiot, um, but. <laughs> Like, I'm sure Luka Doncic will have, like, 30,000 points of his career at some point. Like, there's a lot of great European players in the NBA over, like, the past, like, five years. I mean, I'm just thinking of, like, Jokic, uh, Giannis, um, but Killian Hayes in that category. Like, there's a lot of uh, European players that are making the NBA really fun to watch. So, I want to know, okay, I'm going to look up Dirk Nowinski's total points i think he's at thirty thousand. yeah i don't even know why i said twenty five thousand. i think he's closer to 30 that's a lot of points Thirty one thousand. he has yeah yeah i'm a dumbass (laughs) (laughs) you're fine so i mean if anybody knew the exact number for dirk Nowinski's amount of points they're they're a nerd um do you think though that there are more points coming from the country of croatia and do you think they total more than dirk Nowinski's total career points no, I don't think so. I think like Bojan, Tony Kukoc, and maybe like one other player, I think is like active right now in the NBA. I think there's a guy on the Utah Jazz is from Croatia. He's got, um, he like, I guess he held a record right now in the NBA for like the most points. He had like 48 this season, but Ooh. I'm sure Bojan could break that too. <laughs> so that article you had put in the prep um, sheet. They actually said he has the highest number of points for a for a player from Croatia. He broke Drazen Petrovic's record. Drazen had forty five, and I think Bojan. I think he had forty eight. Huh? Maybe I read the article wrong. I thought it said that uh, that guy had the most, and Bojan could break it this season. It says in May twenty twenty one, he broke Drazen Petrovic's Croatian NBA record. I didn't. Okay, Croatian NBA record is that really a thing? Yeah, I guess, like, if you're Koi, Croatian. I can't even say Croatian. Holy crap. <laughs> yeah, he, and he scored 48 points for the Utah Jazz against the Denver Nuggets back in 2021. Yeah, Bojan. Is he is he the greatest player from Croatia? Can we, can we safely say that now? Yeah, I mean, you could say that. I mean, no disrespect to Tony Kukoc. He was a really good player, but Bojan's bag is so deep. Like, a lot of Pistons fans just thought he was just like this – you know, sharpshooter, but like he can put, you know, he can go to the basket. I mean, he had a beautiful assist against um, Golden State when he was just like sitting on his ass, finding Dern for the dunk. Like, that was cool. Like, his bag is so deep. Like, he's more than just a shooter. What country do you think has the least amount of points? And I challenge anybody to find this for me in the YouTube comments because I looked for any website that had this and I could not find a website that would show me points by country. I didn't feel like going through individual players. That is something that I know someone on Pistons Twitter would probably do. So if anyone from Pistons Twitter is watching, I challenge you to tweet at us who has the least amount of points uh, from a country. I'm going to assume it's like, I don't know, Russia. (laughs) No, I'm going to assume it's India because I think they've only had one guy in the NBA, and I think he played for the Mavericks for like 10 minutes. Okay, yeah, maybe India. I don't know. <laughs> I hope it is India just because they have so many people in the country and they can't find one good, one player good enough to be in the NBA to make a difference. <laughs> That's a bad <laughs> joke. But, uh, so I got a question for you, though. Would Bojan make your all-time NBA team of foreign players? I know that we think about this all the time, but. So are you talking about, like, if you had a starting five? 
out of like, you know, each, you know, like country outside of the United States. That's what you're talking about. Well, I'm not just saying starting five. I'm saying like if you're putting together like a 12 man team of foreign players, where is he a starter or is he even on your team? I think he'd be on the bench. I don't know if he's a starter. Yeah, I don't know. I'm trying to think of like all the great like uh your like foreign born players at his position. Like you're not gonna start him over Luka Doncic already. Like I you can make an argument you wouldn't start him over Mano Ginobili. Yeah, I was gonna say him, Mano Ginobili next. Um uh, <laughs> you're not starting him at the four over Dirk. So yeah, I think yeah, he'd, he'd, he'd be on the bench for sure though. Yeah, definitely. Then I started thinking about this. How many Pistons would make your all time NBA team, if any would? Like like my all time Pistons team or just all time of like just NBA players? Um, all time NBA players. How many Pistons make your team? Um Tough I fight. think I think one. And I think it would be Isaiah Thomas. Ooh, so I have one sometimes. No, I have one, but I did I did, I um I have to decide between these two players. Ben Wallace and Dennis Rodman. Just for the defense. Yeah, I mean when I when I look at like every NBA team and like the greatest players of each NBA team, Isaiah Thomas to me is still one of the greatest point guards that ever played the game of basketball. Yeah, I I still think he's top two behind Magic Johnson. Like I know some people want to give the crown to Steph Curry for this generation, but to me, I, I feel like Isaiah Thomas played the tougher generation. I like I like having Isaiah Thomas on an all time team. I I wouldn't put him on mine just because I don't know. I feel like I have too many playmakers, and that's it. But I would probably go Dennis Rodman over Ben Wallace just for that defensive versatility. Like I'm trying to protect the planet from aliens here. Like if we're doing this whole Space Jam thing, and they said Lance, we need you to pick the team. Don't worry, guys, you're in good hands. I got this figured out. And Dennis Rodman, because you always need one psycho on a team. He's my guy, and we're saving the planet. Yeah, I mean, it, there's there's a lot of great Pistons. I mean, you could throw Dave Bing in there. You could throw uh, Bet Wallace, Dennis Rodman. Um, the Pistons have had a lot of great players. Uh, but, like, if I'm just, like, I'm looking at point guards, and I'm just looking at, like, if I had to pick one Piston, it's, it's going to be Isaiah. Yeah, I look at, like, you know, it, it's funny, like, you, you'll you say, like, you said Dave Bing. I'm like, yeah, but, I mean, he is a great player, but if I have a chance to pick out of the entire NBA pool of all time, Dave Bing probably doesn't crack my top five at the shooting guard position, and that's no offense to him. It's just we've had some great players at that position. Like, a great guy like him, a great player like him would be buried because there's just been so much talent at that spot. Yeah, I mean – People are calling you, well, probably both of us out because we didn't have uh, Big Shot Bob, RIP. <laughs> yeah, Bob Lanier is ahead of his time, honestly. Like, if you watch the tape on him, like, he could play in today's NBA. Like, he could stretch the floor, he had a really good post game. Um, uh, to Pete uh, Bo's point or his question, I think Bob Lanier would be in consideration, but I, I look at guys like Wilt Chamberlain. I look at guys like Shaquille O'Neal, uh, Akeem Olajuwon. I mean, there, there's so many great centers that have played in this league. I do think he would he would be on the outside looking in for me if, if I had to pick like an all-time starting five. But if we're talking about like a Pistons, like an all-time Pistons starting five, then yeah, I would definitely have Bob, Bob, Len, Bob Lanier in my like all-time Pistons starting five. Yeah, I think, again, it's kind of like Dave Bing. Bob Lanier's in the same spot. They're just both at really tough positions. Like, it's no disrespect not to have Bob Lanier on the team. Oh, we're talking an all-time NBA team. Because you have guys, like Anthony said, Akeem Olajuwon, Shaquille O'Neal, Wilt Chamberlain, Patrick Ewing, David Robinson. Um, Bill Russell, um, shit. I forgot yeah, about him. Yeah, same. And, you know, just all these guys at the position. Moses Malone, we'll throw him in there as well. There's a lot of guys great guys at the five spot same way at the two spot so i don't know dennis rodman's my answer isaiah thomas is anthony's answer so yeah that's it those are our pistons that would be on our all-time nba teams this is going to be this next thing we're about to bring up i think is going to piss a few people off and the rookie of the year narrative is changing and it's not about winning anymore <laughs> Did you did you read this article? How stupid this thing was. 
I read it. I didn't actually think it was that dumb of an article. I thought it was pretty insightful. But the, the one thing I would say of how it differs from Cade and Paolo is Paolo has been dominant since he's entered the league. And it took Cade a couple of months to get into his farm. Like, you look at Paolo's numbers, and they're so similar to Blake Griffin in his prime. Like, Paolo is putting up monster numbers as a rookie. And not to say Orlando, they're not a playoff team, but they've been winning a lot more games. So I could understand why they have Paolo number one, you know, Benedict Matherin, you know, number two. Indiana's a playoff team. And then you, you have Keegan Murray three, who, again, the Kings are like a fifth seed in the West. Um, a lot of those guys are play- on playoff teams outside of Paolo. But um, I think the narrative last year was just because Cade was in Detroit. If Cade was in Houston, they probably would have given, given him rookie of the year. It's just, you know, the, the NBA doesn't really like to give the Detroit Pistons that much media attention because there's not a lot of money to be made. Because you at the end of the day, the NBA is a business and they're trying to make money. So it, it would be more sexy for them to, you know, market a city like Toronto for Scotty Barnes last year than market than Kate Cunningham in Detroit because Toronto is a way bigger market than Detroit. Yeah, but okay, I, sh- I shouldn't have said the whole article was stupid because I mainly was just fixated on one paragraph and it goes, mostly they're asked to shine relative to their draft class peers. However... That might show itself. Individual numbers often determine the winners with the newbie's contribution to winning or losing mattering hardly at all. That's the part I don't like. Like, I don't think you can flip the script from year to year. You can't say one year, rookie of the year, it's all dependent on winning. Evan Mobley, Scotty Barnes, they're contributing. Dude, you know how bad the Pistons would have been without Cade last year? And I don't really want to make it a whole rookie of the year. Cade should have won it over Scotty Barnes. I I understand why they picked it. I just didn't like the reasoning behind it. And I don't like that, you know, these rookie ladder, they're changing their narrative where they're like, oh, last year we were kind of nitpicking and saying Cade didn't deserve it, even though he clearly did have the best rookie year. But Detroit didn't win that many games. So we're not, we're just going to bypass and just skip him this year. But this year, eh, winning, throwing that out the door doesn't matter. We're just going to pick the rookie with the best numbers. That's what irritates me and pisses me off because it wasn't fair for Cade last year and I think that paragraph just kind of proves it like everything that we had said like the propaganda we all you know put out there last year was right like it was yeah I've kind of moved on and I I don't even give a shit (laughs) like I I, like I don't care like yeah he didn't win rookie of the year but uh we got the first overall pick and he's one of the better rookies out of his draft class I mean Jalen Green has improved a lot this season um, he had a really bad rookie year last year, but he's shown tremendous strides this season. Um, Evan Mobley, obviously, he's on a, a to me, I, I think, a, champ, a championship caliber team Yeah. Uh, when the Cavs are healthy. Uh, the Cavs are a very good team. Shout out to the, Donovan Mitchell dropping 71. Like, holy shit. Um, I know a lot of Pistons fans, when they saw that, they're like, damn you, Stan Van Gundy. Damn you. <laughs> <laughs> They got PTSD when they saw that, but um, yeah, man, like if the NBA wants to, you know, flip the script on, you know, for Paulo Bencaro's rookie campaign, so be it. I mean, Paulo's putting up really good numbers, like what, 27 and three. That, that, that's pretty good. Yeah, no, and I'm not, I'm not saying it just for Cade because I'm glad that they have decided that winning doesn't matter. Like it would be. I wouldn't say, like, if they put Benedict Matherin at number one because the Indiana Pacers were in the playoff, I'd be like, okay, this is what we're doing from year to year. You know, at least Benedict Matherin's putting up good numbers off the bench for a winning team, so I get it. Last year, winning played an important factor in rookie of the year, but and I'm glad it doesn't this year because Paolo definitely is head over head and shoulders over every other rookie right now with the numbers he's putting up in Orlando. And he, right now, he should be rookie of the year. And it would be a... I think it would be a black eye in the NBA if he didn't win rookie of the year because he was on a losing team, just like it was last year on the NBA. And it didn't even have to go to Cade. Like, if they had said, hey, Jalen Green was the best rookie and he got rookie of the year, even though the Houston Rockets weren't winning, I would respect it. But it just is kind of shitty. For one year, they just decided to make winning important for this award when in my lifetime I haven't got to see a Detroit Piston win rookie of the year and I really wanted to see it so I was just being selfish that's it I mean you got to see Grant Hill win co-rookie of the year with Jason Kidd dude I was like four or five years old when that happened. 
Uh, but I, I think the media has a lot to say with Rookie of the Year. Definitely. And, you know, you have guys on big platforms like ESPN or Fox Sports that kind of like to say, you know, and get up. You know, maybe Stephen A. Smith is like, yeah, Paulo Bancaro should win Rookie of the Year. You know how many, like, people that follow Stephen A. Smith in the media will, you know, have a cast to vote for Paulo? Um, the media has such a powerful voice in voting that, um, you know, maybe some people didn't like Cade's game because it wasn't that sexy. You know, it's very methodical. It's it's slow. It's it's not like energetic, like a Jalen Green or even Scotty Barnes. It's it just they couldn't campaign it. You know, it's yeah. it's all about marketability. And that's why I said, you know, it's NBA is not going to make any money if Cade wins rookie of the year. NBA is, you know, out for dollar signs. I mean. I was telling you like a month ago that they bought the rights to, you know, Victor Wenambania's games. I mean, that's how money hungry they are right now. Definitely. He's not even in the NBA yet. Like, what the hell are we doing? Uh, I don't know. I guess I'm still salty. I, I can't look. It's every time I see, every time I hear Rookie of the Year, I get, I don't want to downplay PTSD, but I get basketball PTSD, which is probably like the weakest form of PTSD a person can have. Hey, hey, <laughs> when Victor, when the Pistons get the number one pick, and Victor Winabania doesn't win Rookie of the Year. Um, we'll have a intervention. Oh my gosh, that's gonna drive me to drug use, like hard drug use, if that happens. <laughs> but I do hope the Pistons win the lottery. That would be huge. Yeah, that's better than winning Rookie of the Year for sure. <laughs> um, so Andre Drummond, a rookie that I thought had a chance to win Rookie of the Year, but I was definitely wrong, is open to coming back to Detroit, and. I don't know. He's 29 years old. He's averaging six and seven for Chicago right now. He's coming off the bench. What do you, how do you feel about Andre Drummond returning to Detroit? I talked about it a little bit and you know, there, there were two sides of the fence. Like there are some Pistons fans that watched Drummond from when he was a rookie and they understand that the team tried to make him into Dwight Howard and he's not Dwight Howard. Yeah. <laughs> and the way the team was, you know, constructed with draft picks and free agency was just a blunder on Stan Van Gundy. Like they, they kind of like blew his prime and his opportunity when he was here in Detroit. So I understand, you know, those fans saying, yeah, I, I would welcome him back as a bench role, but there are other fans where there's so many Pistons fans that have such a bad taste in their mouth over the Andre Drummond era that I can understand it. A lot of people, they kind of go overboard in a sense where they like, you know, he, he's soft, he's weak, he he doesn't like basketball, all he does is focus on rap. Like a lot a lot of people have really salty feelings over Drummond. And I think they got those salty feelings when he got that max contract and he didn't produce like a max player. But the Pistons wouldn't bring Drummond in to start over Duran. They wouldn't, you know, give him a max contract. He signed vet minimums for the past couple of seasons, like let me ask you this. Would you rather have Andre Drummond off your bench backing up Duran and Stewart, or would you rather have Marvin Bagley? Ooh. I would, Bagley's making $12 million. Yeah, no, and I mean, ideally I'd rather have Bagley just because he has a more offensive game, and he can block a few shots here and there. I mean, but, uh, man, availability is the best thing, so I'd – as much as it might pain me to say, I think I might have I'd rather have Andre Drummond backing those two up because he's available from game to game. And Marvin Bagley, he's out and he gets hurt consistently. So I would probably go Andre Drummond, you know, right now, even though the I I would rather have Marvin Bagley, but I'm just he's not available all the time. So I probably I would go Andre Drummond. Well, not only that, I I kind of look at like we, we've talked about Duran and, like, how he's the center of the future and how he's a really good passer. Like, Drummond's a really great passer, too. Yeah. And I think if you did bring him back off the bench, you could – there would be really no drop-off, right? Like, you could still run dribble handoffs. You'd still be crashing the glass. You'd still be, like, winning the rebounding battles on a night-to-night -night basis. And to get him at a vet's minimum to me, dude, I, I just think it's a steal. Like, he's older. He understands – um, what it takes to get to the playoffs, even though he did get swept twice in 2016 and 2018. He understands uh, the work you have to put in. He understands the organization. And 
Like, I, I would welcome him back, dude. Like, honestly, I love Marvin Bagley, but you signed him to a $36 million deal. He's gotten injured twice in the last six months. Um, I love Marvin Bagley, but it, it's just like these ticky tack injuries where he's out for six to eight weeks, it seems like, every time he does get injured. Yeah, I was thinking about this um, when you had tweeted this out that Andre Drummond was open to coming back to Detroit. And I thought about it where, you know, I mean, he's similar to Duran in a way that he's athletic, has a nose to get rebounds, can be a lob threat, good for in the he's a good role man. And, you know, I mean, we, you need that. So as much as I love Marvin Bagley like you do, Anthony, it's just, dude, the ticky-tack foul. I mean, the ticky-tack injuries, man. It just sucks for him, and it sucks for his future in Detroit. So I would rather go this guy. And Andre Drummond is averaging, what, six and se- six and seven in Chicago in only 14 minutes. So he's productive in less time, too. So even if the Pistons did bring Andre Drummond back, it's not like he's playing 20, 22-plus minutes a night. He'd be probably 14 to 18 like he is in Chicago, and he can contribute in that limited amount of time. So, yeah, I wouldn't mind Andre Drummond back in Detroit because even though I did tweet at you and said, I want to see the the young bigs go at it for a few seasons before you know they bring Andre Drummond back, I'd, I wouldn't mind Andre Drummond back as, ne- as soon as next season. Yeah, I mean, it, it's not... No, I, I, I'm not saying Bagley's a bad player. I'm not picking on Bagley, but the way Casey uses Bagley, he's playing him out of position. Yeah, C- Casey's playing Bagley at the five when he's not a five. He's a four. Like he, he's he's more of a four than he is a five. Now, if you want to, you know, still you're you're still going to keep Bagley on this team because no one's touching that contract. You're stuck with them for the yeah. next three seasons. You could have Bagley and Drummond off your bench, and you could have Stewart and uh, Duran as your 4-5. So you would have a 4-5 combo on your starting rotation and off your bench uh, that would just kill the glass. Yeah, it would. And, man, that's a lot more length than this team has had in a long time. So, yeah, I wouldn't mind it. I I just think, though, sometimes – maybe it sounds stupid, but four big men all contributing night in and night out, it just seems kind of like a log jam. Like, I don't know how you dispense the minutes – from night to night like i mean are all these guys going to be playing less than 30 minutes if andre drummond comes to detroit like are we only going to get like 28 minutes a night of isaiah stewart and jalen duran because you know marvin bagley and andre drummond both have to eat that's the only thing so i guess if they bring andre drummond back i'm okay with marvin bagley being on the team as well but i think i would rather have them try to move him you know so It seems kind of crazy, though, that we're talking about Andre Drummond, who's almost 30 years old, versus Marvin Bagley, because we all know what Marvin Bagley can do offensively. It's just, you know, him being consistent and him being just healthy from night in and night out. And if he can't do those two things, you got to find his replacement. It's a business. Yeah, I mean, best availability, you know, like you have to be available. Like, and he hasn't been available this season. And it's nothing against him. He's a great player. He's a double-double machine. But, like, these injuries um, aren't great, and he's one of the highest-paid players on your roster right now. Sad, man. It really is for Marvin Bagley. Um, We got another piece of – we got another topic right here, or news, I should say. My bad. The Cavs, the Milwaukee Bucks, the Suns, the Mavericks, and the Lakers have shown interest in trading for Boyan. This comes from Bleacher Report. The Pistons' asking price is at least one first-round pick and either a young player with upside or additional draft capital in a swap. Um, first and foremost, do you think that's too much for Bojan, what the Pistons are asking for? I don't, no. Uh, I think the Pistons' value Bojan is a big piece, and a lot of teams have called the Pistons Um since I did put this in the prep, now there's up to 10 plus teams that have called the Pistons about Boyan. Wow. Um, a lot of, I, I would probably say Boyan is going to be the most targeted player during this deadline because Boyan provides everything a championship and a playoff team needs, and that's a lead three point shooting. Yep. Um, and the Pistons asking price, I don't think is unreasonable. Unprotected first round pick and a young asset. Hey, man, like if you want Boyan, pay up. Because the Pistons just aren't going to do you favors. They're not going to trade you uh, a player like Bojan on a cheap deal for peanuts. You're going to have to pay up if you want them. 
So my next question is, do you think the Pistons are asking for all that because they really don't want to trade Bojan and they know like for some teams that might be too steep? Well, I, I, I go back to the Derrick Rose era. Yeah. And I, I remember the Pistons were in a similar situation with Derrick Rose. You know, a lot of teams were calling about him and they were asking for a first round pick. And they didn't get a first round pick, but they did get uh, Dennis Smith Jr., who is still fa- fairly young and a second round pick. Now, if the Pistons get an offer, let's just say Phoenix, Phoenix calls and say, hey, we'll give you a Cam Johnson in a second. Like, are you going to consider that? I mean, I know I would. Like, it just depends what young talent these teams offer. And if they don't have the young talent offer, you know, unprotected first, I think the Pistons would think about it. Yeah. I, I love that Suns trade for Cam Johnson. That's like the only trade I would want to do. Cause I was looking at the Mavericks offer where I think it was like a 2027 first round pick or 2026 first round pick in like Josh green and Josh green. I think he's probably, he's going to be in the NBA for a while. I just, He's probably in that same boat as Hami, though, right? Kind of like that type of player where they're always missing that one thing that would take them over the top, but they're extremely athletic. They play with energy, so there's always a role for those guys. So I thought that was the best trade package until Phoenix jumped in, you know, to the rumors and, you know, throwing up Cam Johnson. I would I would love Cam Johnson for Bojan. That's a win. Even if it's just those two, even if it's just a player swap, it's just Bojan for Cam Johnson. I don't even know if the money works. But even if it's just that, I'm, I'm walking away with that feeling like a winner if I'm the Pistons. Yeah, I mean, you saw the Cavs in there. You saw the Mavs. Like, I wouldn't trade with the Mavs because I, I look at their roster and it's full of role, overpriced role players. Yep. I mean, the only – like, I, I mentioned um, Christian Wood yeah, uh, a couple of months ago because he's on a one-year deal. So, if it doesn't work, it doesn't work. Um, and then you'd have, you know, $15 million in cap space to play with anyways. But I don't even think the Mavs would do that because Christian Wood is, like, the second-best player uh, right next to Luka Doncic. Like, the Mavs really don't have a lot to offer, and they're kind of stuck with the, the bad contracts that they did give out. Um, if, if Phoenix wanted to, I mean – I don't know. I feel like you'd probably have to take Jay Crowder on in that situation too. Yeah, but so out of those teams, the Cavs, the Bucks, the Suns, Mavs, and Lakers, are we both agreeing that the the Suns are the only team we want the Pistons to trade with? Yeah, I mean, if I had to choose one, it would probably be Phoenix. How would you rank those five teams though, and based on assets that you that you personally want? Lakers uh, are fifth, though, right? Oh yeah, the Lakers are the fifth. My, my one thing is I do not trade in my own division. I'm not trading with the Cavs or the Bucks because I don't want to see Bojan four times a year torching me for 30. Man, we might only have to see him four times a year for like another two seasons, though. I mean, he's, he is up there in age. <laughs> but still, man, like I, I'm not I'm not going to let the Cavs get better when I'm trying to get better. You know, like I'm not giving Cleveland or Mo, like Milwaukee would probably give you Grayson Allen. Oh, like, God, he looks older than Bojan, too. It's crazy. Do you really want Grayson Allen? No. The Cavs, I mean, they'd probably offer you, like, Isaac Okoro, who can't shoot. That's what we need, another non-shooter. Like, <laughs> Dude, Yeah, see, all these trades, all these teams suck. I don't want any of these guys as part of it. Just give me Cam Johnson. That's it. That's all I want. Like, if Phoenix wants to do that, go for it. I mean, like, that they're, they're losing so many games because Devin Booker's out. Chris Paul is, like, in and out of the lineup. Like, they, they may look at Bojan as kind of like a saving grace. Like, if they gave me Cam Johnson and their first-round pick this year, I would highly consider it. Dude, I I mean, hold, imagine looking to the Pistons and looking at Bojan and be like, you know what? He might be the guy <laughs> to save our team. I mean, he's a, he's a, Dev, a Devin Booker replacement is what Bojan is. That's incredible. Okay. <laughs> You're just getting crazy there. Dude, I mean, <laughs> did you see that uh, the Dallas Mavericks have waived Kemba Walker? I did, I did, and I'm not surprised by that. Um, they waived him because of uh, they didn't waive him by a certain date. They have to guarantee his salary, so that's why they did that. Do you think uh, Jaden Hardy gets more minutes though for the Mavericks? I don't know. Jason Kidd's pretty strict with giving rookies time. Um, I, I I I talked to a friend of mine that does cover the Mavericks and. She said that he kills it in the G League, you know, drops like 20 on a nightly basis, but there's just no room for him right now. He just had 15 points in their last game, though. 
Yeah, I mean, the kid can get buckets. We know that. Like, he can score at the NBA level. It's just all the other things that I think kind of you know, limit his playing time. Yeah, I just I just thought, like, I know that they got rid of Kemba, and I knew it was for the salary, but I also thought maybe they do have some – maybe they want to see what Hardy's about just because the All-Star break is coming up. So, you know, they got a few – you know, got a couple weeks to try him out. Let's see. Yeah, so. I mean, he's a great player, man. I know uh, that's who I wanted with our second-round pick, but we did draft Persita, so we're going to have to wait and see what Persita's all about. But, I mean, Hardy was right there. He was. He was. We got one piece of injury news. Um, and that's Marvin Bagley the third will have right hand. Well, he has a right hand injury and will be out for an extended period of time. Didn't he have surgery on his hand too? Yeah, he had a surgery on his metacarpals. So he had surgery on his middle finger and his ring finger, and he's going to be out for six to eight weeks. Was it his shooting hand? I'm not sure. I'd have to ask. Oh, it says his right hand. My bad. I, I just read that out loud. Okay, yeah. <laughs> Yeah, so it's on his right, so it's non-shooting. Do you, is it safe to say that uh, Marvin Bagley is injury prone? Is that the label we can give him for this season? I think you can. I, I think he's been a very injury prone player um, this year. I mean, he did kind of have a freak injury with, uh, I think, I believe it was OKC where he kind of got tangled up under the basket, and then he was out for six to eight weeks. And then again, you know, finger got jammed another six to eight weeks. So. I think it's fair to label him injury prone for this year. Man, I'm looking. Okay, I'm looking at it right now. He played. He's never played. He's only played 60 games or more one time in his career, and that was his rookie year where he played 62. Then it was 13, 43, 48, 38, um, or 48, 48, and then 25 this year. So I don't know, man. This dude is always out. Uh, I mean, the contract isn't that bad, obviously, but it just sucks for Marvin Bagley, man. Especially when, like, he starts to kind of figure things out. He just goes down with an injury, man. It just sucks. It really yeah. does. Yeah, I mean, like, uh, your boy Isaiah Livers was supposed to come back, and then no. he just – he's not coming back. Like, <laughs> they got to reevaluate his shoulder again. Like, they, they don't know what's going on. Like, I, I hope he doesn't have to get surgery because, like, that is his shooting shoulder, so – Ah oh, man, I don't even. I didn't want to bring Isaiah Livers up. I feel so bad for that kid. I really do. I really hey man, he's a good. He's a good cheerleader on the bench. I I, I laugh at his reactions on the bench like ninety percent of the time because he's really entertaining to watch on the bench. He does. He does make some faces, man. He really does. Um. So we'll close this out just by saying, hey, Marvin Bagley, rest up, get healthy, and let's see you back on the floor in six to eight weeks. For sure. So you pointed this out, the Pistons' free throw improvement. Last season, the Pistons ranked 13th in free throw attempts. This season, they ranked first in free throw. How did they do this? How did they just make a jump like that? Well, there are two players on this team that are follow baiters. Oh, Bojan and Alec Perk, right? Yeah, and surprisingly, Jaden Ivey. Okay, Jaden Ivey, huh? How many free throw attempts does he have? Jade Nivey is almost up to, uh, I think the last chart I read, 4.7 a game. Wow. Okay. I wonder what his total is, though, compared to Cade's. Yeah, Cade, Cade's are pretty low, but Bojan and Alec Burks and Jade Nivey lead the team in free throw attempts. So they lead the league in getting to the free throw line. They don't lead the league in percentage, but I think that's a, that's a really big jump if you think about it, going from 13th to 1st. So, wait, you said Ivy, Burks, and Bojan, all three of them lead the league combined? They lead the Pistons, not the league. Oh, okay, okay. I was going to say, uh, I believe Joel Embiid's, like, close to eight oh, per wow. game. <laughs> so, who leads the team in free throw attempts? That would be Alec Burks. Oh, man, I'm not surprised by that. He is so good at getting to the line. That um one, oh, man, who was he? Who was he being defended by last night? That, like, bump? Bumping him into the chest and just getting to the line and just like looking at him. Oh, it was Jeremy uh, Sokin. Sohan. Yeah. Sohan, my bad. And yeah, they were making a comment on it. They're like, Alec Burks went through a 6'8, 6'9 guy. Like it was easy. Like it was just like a hot knife through butter. It was, <laughs> dude, Alex Burke is just, he's one of my favorite players to watch, man. He is incredible. That's why I kind of wanted to keep him like on the team because I, I want him to teach Jaden Ivy and Kay just how to bait fouls because it's such a lost art. Like, it's not like Trey Young or 
like James Harden flopping. It's more of like getting into the shooting pocket and waiting for the defender to have his arm when you're ready to go up. Like he just does it so fast. You don't even realize it. No, he he's so good at doing it. And I would love for Cade to learn from that's something Cade needs in his back pocket. He need he needs that in his bag really to get to the free throw line. If Cade could up his up to like, I don't know, even just six free throw attempts per game, it's just going to change his whole game. Yeah. I mean like the, the two veterans that we traded for, Boyan and Alec Burks, um, are leaders at getting to the line. So it kind of shows you the vision of Troy Weaver was uh, going for. Oh, definitely, definitely. It's, ah, oh, man, we could talk about his genius, you know, all the time. But, uh, man, the Pistons free throw. T- that's that. I just, I'm surprised that they are first. That's really just it for me. I, I was just surprised by that when you put when you put that up there. Yeah, I got to give uh, James Edwards a third uh, shout out for that because that was from uh, his athletic article. He did a really good piece on uh, Jade Nivey, um, where he he talked to like every NBA, not every NBA coach, but like you know the veteran NBA coaches, and they all had like really positive um, comments about Jade Nivey and how he'll figure it out, and Mike Brown basically comparing him to Westbrook two point oh. I I actually do really like that comparison, and it gives me like remember when i've been saying like troy weaver's trying to build his own oklahoma city big three that just plays into it too ivy being that rust type yeah i, I was thinking about that like kind of like comparisons like i'm I'm thinking about sadiq bay and i thought of jeff green immediately that's a good one too even because they both have those consistency issues as well yeah awesome. he's just not as bouncy as jeff green jeff green he put some people on some posters like it's insane still Dude, Jeff Green has some of my. He has one. He has some good highlight tapes out there that people have made for him, which is crazy because it's Jeff Green. But Jeff Green, dude, he was a killer at Georgetown, dude. I I really thought him and KD would be a duo for like a decade in Seattle, Oklahoma City. I I really thought that. Um, did you see? I this is what I don't like though. Cause Ivy, you know, Ivy's kind of reckless. Mm-hmm. Did you see that offensive foul they called on him against Portland when he went at Nurek and they were like, yeah, we're going to see if it's a flagrant one. They almost gave him a flagrant one for attacking the rim. I thought that was just so crazy. Yeah. It, it's probably really hard to ref his games. Cause he plays with such a ferocious, you know, tenacity. Yeah. It's just the, like his first step is so quick and that like, you can't teach that. Like, he's just such a good basketball player. Um, but the, the one thing with him right now is just consistency. And yeah. I, I've kind of felt like he's hit his rookie wall a little bit. So someone dropped him in our fantasy basketball league, and I immediately picked him up because Killian Hayes was coming back. Mm-hmm. And I think Killian Hayes just makes a huge difference for his game. Limits the turnovers, puts him in better spots, takes a little pressure off him. Do you think that was a win for me, picking up Jaden Ivey? The way no, that'd be a hell. What? You don't even know who I gave up for him. What'd you give up? Zach Collins. I guess it's a win. Uh, I mean, if you're talking about like percentages, that's just percentages and turnovers alone. That's an L. But um, <laughs> I, I mean, yeah, but I think like last night, I think he what shot fifty four percent from the field. Mm-hmm. He, now I've had him for about a week now, but I've only I only played him last night. I didn't play him. Oh, I didn't have to play him on the other nights. You know who I was more impressed with was Killian Hayes' first game back. He oh, did God, yes. He, he didn't score a whole lot, but he dropped 13 assists. Yeah, were you a little concerned with him coming back? Like, were you thinking, like, damn, dude, he's missed three games. The confidence might be shot. But, dude, he kind of looks like a gangster out there, bro. Like, I'm afraid of Killian now when I watch him. Yeah, it's it, – it's, I, I think he got a lot of respect around the NBA – and in the media, like every media outlet I watch with the Killian Hayes, um, they were all laughing. They're like, dude, he knocked his ass out. Like, I-, I think more people know who Killian Hayes is now. And he's just playing with such a confidence right now. Like, he just seems like such a confident point guard. Like, the Pistons have like a legitimate floor general. Like, he had a pass last night to Isaiah Stewart. Bro, that thing was beautiful. Yeah, in the corner. I saw that on Instagram. I made a comment. Yeah, it was absolutely beautiful. Um, so a friend of mine, shout out to Brooks. He might be watching. Well, no, I don't know if he is or not. 
he uh, messaged me on Instagram and he asked me, I want to hear your thoughts on this comparison. Okay. He was saying that Killian, the, the way he's playing right now and the way he's been playing for the, I don't know, past like 20 games, I guess, or whatever it is for Killian, that Killian's play has reminded him of Jason Kidd. Do you like that comparison or do you hate that comparison? You know, I was thinking about it last night. Don't hate the comparison, but I'll, I'll use a player that hasn't played this year, but he's still in the NBA. Plays a lot like Lonzo Ball. Ooh. Like a yeah. lot like Lonzo Ball. Like good defender, great passer, kind of streaky from three. But like I, I look at Killian, I kind of think like that's the ceiling is Lonzo Ball. Wasn't Lonzo Ball compared to Jason Kidd, though? Wasn't there some comparisons to him? There was. I, I, I just think when you're comparing, you know, Killian to a Hall of Famer like yeah. that, it's kind of hard because Jason Kidd played at a high level for multiple years. Yes. Um, but I, I think Killian and Lonzo Ball are very similar. Um, I, I think the one thing with Killian is I think he's actually a better passer than Lonzo Ball is right now. And that that's saying something because Lonzo Ball's a really great passer, so is his brother. Oh yeah. Um, like, it just makes me wonder, like, if everybody was healthy, like, obviously Killian's not going to be starting. He'd be at your bench point guard, but you you give me ten assists off the bench. That's a good basketball team, dude. I mean, if it's going to be a fun year when everybody's healthy next year. It's going to be a fun year just to kind of see how all these guys, how their games have grown and then how they mesh and gel together when they're all healthy. That's what I'm excited for next season. So I don't know. I thought that was kind of a cool comparison, but I'm with you. I don't like making the comparisons to Hall of Famers because I think that sets an unreal expectation. But since you compared him to Lonzo Ball, I feel better about comparing him to Jason Kidd because I like the Lonzo Ball comparison, but I think all three of those guys kind of fit into the same guard type archetype where, you know, they're bigger guards known for their defense, streaky shooters, incredible pass, incredible vision, but all, all three love to get out and transition and push the ball. And that's where they really can make magic happen. Yeah, for sure. Um, so I actually just got a DM on Twitter and this is actually a, a trade package. So this comes from Nicholas Stone. Shout out to Nicholas Stone um, for this trade package. Holy crap. Um, so everyone listening, this is from just a, a follower, and he, he's got a three-team trade with the Detroit Pistons, Toronto Raptors, and San Antonio Spurs. Ooh, okay. So in this trade, the Detroit Pistons would get Gary Trent Jr. Okay. OG Ananobi. Hmm. And Otto Porter, Toronto would get Bojan, Alec Burks, Yoko Pertle for San Antonio, and Ronnie Magruder. And the Spurs would get Sadiq Bey, Precious Achua from the Raptors, and uh, some center on the Raptors, uh, Coco Loco. I- I'm not sure. Um, <laughs> as much as I hate trade machine trades, I do appreciate uh, Nicholas for sending this over. I just don't think it's realistic. I think it's cool. Like, if you were able to get Gary Trent, OG, and Otto Porter from the Raptors, like, brother, like, take that to the bank and run. <laughs> like, that's such a steal for the Pistons that they were trying to compete for the playoffs. Yeah, I, I don't even know why. Like, I mean, I'm not – it's a credible trade for the Detroit Pistons, but, I mean – we got to think about this for the Raptors. Like, what? I mean, they're, I mean, no offense to Boyan and Alec Berg, but I mean, they just got worse. That doesn't make any sense. That team is better with OG and Gary Trent and Boyan and Alec Berg. It's like, you don't, that's, I, that's crazy. I will say this, though. There are some like NBA talk going around that the Raptors are looking to rebuild sooner than later. Okay. Because the timelines really don't fit with Scotty Barnes and like Fred Van Vliet, who just turned down a hundred million dollar extension from the Raptors, um, Pascal Siakam, who I know there's, I can't remember, there is a follower in this chat that loves Pascal Siakam. He wants us to trade for Pascal Siakam, which I wouldn't hate. I wouldn't hate that either. No, I, I like Pascal. I would, I'd love to have t- uh, Tasmanian Devil in Detroit. So, but I mean, if the, if the. Tr- if the timeline doesn't fit for Scotty Barnes and Van Vliet, why are you trading OG on a newbie and Gary Trent who are closer to Scotty Barnes? Like, couldn't you just keep those two on the team and then trade Pascal Siakam and Van Vliet 
for some pieces or some picks? Like, wouldn't those two be the that you'd want to trade for? I don't know why Toronto would give up OG on Anubi if they're in a rebuild. I mean, I got this in a contract year. I, I don't know if you saw, but it was a it was either last week or two weeks ago. Like Toronto's asking price, they want to get a similar haul to what Donovan Mitchell got. Oh, okay. And yep. I just like Donovan Mitchell to me is an all star guard. I don't really think OG Ananobi is on the same asking price as Donovan Mitchell. I do think you could ask for maybe a first round pick and some pick swaps, but I don't think you're getting multiple first round picks for OG Ananobi. I think he's a really good defender. I think uh, they did miss him when he was out of the lineup because they went from like one of the best defenses to one of the worst. Um, but I, I just don't think you're going to get a huge overhaul for uh, OG Ananobi, but I think the Raptor, the Raptors are looking to, you know, possibly blow it up because, you know, they have a lot of money invested in Van Vliet and Siakam and all those guys over there. Oh, so you're saying they're getting rid of the young guys to try to win another championship with the guys that have on the roster. Okay, I get it. That makes sense. But OG averaging 18, 6, 2, and 2 steals per game with almost a block. He is my dark horse for Defensive Player of the Year if he can actually stay healthy for the entire season. Just because I saw this stat where he he legitimately defends 1 through 5. And it, they were breaking down in the percentage. It doesn't matter who the star player is at what percent, at what position. OG on a newbie, he plays defense on him. And I don't know. He's my dark horse for defense player of the year. Yeah, I mean, I, I don't hate it. I still think they'll probably give it to Giannis or something like that. Because yeah, this, this seems like a lot of NBA voters just get, like, fatigue. Like, they're just like, oh, yeah, I'll give it to Giannis again. Yeah, Giannis deserves a couple MVPs and four defense player of the years, even though we got OG on a newbie right here killing it through one through five. Yeah, that would be, man, that'd be incredible. I mean, it looks like Jokic is about to get his third MVP. I mean, that's deservedly so. So, well, Joel Embiid probably deserves one at some point. I mean, Nuggets are the first seed in the West. Yeah. I, right. I, don't, know, I don't know who called that, but <laughs> I mean. <laughs> Dude, I told you, man. I am, dude. I will, uh, I will blow the horn for you, bro. <laughs> like when it, <laughs> that sounded so bad, too. Gosh. Yeah, pause. Told, yeah, pause. <laughs> <laughs> no, um, I love the trade. Like, let's get back to that. I love the trade for the Pistons. It's just unrealistic. But thanks, Nick. Yeah, like I, like I said, I, I rarely answer trade because I get trade machine mentions all the time. Like I got one where it was like a 12 team trade and like he tried taking a screenshot and like the file was just so big. I had to like expand it. I was just like, Holy shit. Like the, the fact that you had a 12 team trade to go through, I'm more impressed that you got it to go through than the actual proposal, because that takes a lot of math. Did, did you see the, uh, what was that? Was it the Athletic or Bleacher Report? I forget who did it, but it was like a 30-team NBA trade. No, I didn't see that, no. I didn't even click the article, but I'm like, dude, a 30-team NBA trade. Everybody's just moving one city over. That's crazy. Um, We do have a Pistons talk player of the win over the Golden State Warriors. They won 122-119. to 119. Dude, by the way, great call because you called them beating the Warriors. Yeah. What did you say they were going to go last week? Because I don't know if we counted Sunday this game. Did you say they were going to go two and two, or did you say they were going to go two and one? I believe I said they. How many games did they have? Four. Um, they would have four if you count the Sunday game. They just have three so far that have been played. Yeah, I thought they were going to go three and one. I thought they would lose to the Blazers, which they did, because the Blazers are just a different animal. I knew they would beat the Warriors because the Warriors, the reason why the Pistons do so well against the Warriors is because they don't have any centers. Yeah. Like, if you have a legitimate center, you're going to beat the Warriors, even with Steph healthy, even with Draymond and Clay healthy. Like, we've beaten them with Steph Curry healthy. We've beaten them with Clay Thompson healthy. It's just the Pistons are just a bad matchup for the Warriors. And Jalen Duran just ate in that game. Like, he'd be my player the the win for sure. Oh, oh, man, not Killian Hayes with his 13 assists? I got to give it to Duran, man. Like, he didn't miss a shot. He did go eight for eight. He had a good game. Um, For me, let me see this, dude. Who hit the game winner? Was that Bojan that hit the game winner? No, it was Sadiq. Okay, that's right. Man, what? what? Man, 
this game was kind of even though they won i wasn't really paying attention to this game just like i haven't really been paying attention to the last pistons games like they're on for me but i've been doing other things in the middle of them the passion yeah I, I mean like that game was just so back and forth um Probably the whole highlight of that game was Draymond Green trying to like kiss Isaiah Stewart. But I mean, like, other than that, like, <laughs> it was a pretty boring game. It, was, it wasn't exciting. Like, outside of like the game winner and Draymond Green getting thrown out, like, so many people made memes of Draymond Green and uh, Isaiah Stewart did the like kiss cam stuff. Cause like, if, I don't know if you've seen the picture, they're like this close to each other. Oh, yeah, I've seen it. That I saw, I was watching the game when it happened, but I mean, yeah, oh, God. Isaiah Stewart is becoming such a menace. <laughs> it's awesome. Dude, he he did something to Draymond during the game, and I was laughing. So uh, Draymond's backing down, and Isaiah Stewart goes like this with his hand in his face when he's, like, trying to see. He's going like this. Like, <laughs> he's just waving. <laughs> That's awesome. Um, Okay, let me pick my player. I'm going Killian Hayes. Okay. Just because he had the nine points, the 13 assists, the one steal. He only had – he had no turnovers, according to ESPN. He had no turnovers in this game. But also, I don't think they win without him and his playmaking because Ivy did not look good at the point guard spot when Killian Hayes was out. I don't think they win this game without Killian Hayes. Yeah, probably not. I just got to – I got to show some love to Duran because, you know, he's a starting setter now. He, he's been playing really good basketball. And to go, you know, eight for eight, you know, just dunking on the Warriors, I got, I got to give it to him. Um, I saw an interesting tweet today. They were wondering why Isaiah Stu- – uh, not Isaiah Stewart, Jalen Duran's block. He hasn't been blocking as many shots as a starter with bigger minutes. Why do you think that is? I think when he was coming off the bench, he was just trying to, you know, um, give you more energy. But I think he's starting to realize, like, being that defensive anchor, it's harder to play help side defense when you're playing against uh, better competition. Like, he was coming off the bench against lesser competition, and he was swatting shots. Yep. Like, it's not really concerning to me because he's a rookie, and I know that he can protect the rim. It's just the help side defense isn't there right now, and it's really hard for him to come all the way across the court to, you know, swat a shot or yeah. block a shot. I also think, too, like, as a starter and playing bigger minutes, you have more responsibilities, and you're counted to be out there for – you know, longer periods of the game versus like coming off the bench where you know you're only going to play like 18 minutes a game. So you're just going to be like, man, I'm just going to go try to block as many shots as I can in 18 minutes because no matter what I do, I'm only playing 18 minutes per game because Bagley and Isaiah Stewart are going to get most of the minutes at those spots. So I'm just here to provide energy and relief, and I'm just here to get rebounds and block as many shots as I can. But as a starter, they need you to be out on the floor longer so you can't take as many risks protecting the paint so i think that's why his block numbers have gone down but also you know to what you were saying you are playing against better competition you know so that fa- plays a factor in it as well it's not not like he's like a lot of people in the comment section saying he's trying to stay out of foul trouble i think that's that's true too yeah i, I do think there's a lot of elusive guards like a lot of fast point guards that you know they're used to you know going up against you know centers like that trying to block their shot. I mean like Trey Young to me like I remember when the Pistons were playing him like he's just such he's so crafty getting around the rim and like he, he knows what the centers are looking for to try to block his shot and I, I think that's like the next art like you don't have to have a high block number as long as you can test it and stay in front of them I'm happy like I don't expect you to block three three shots a game. Yeah, I just want him to change the way guards take it to the rack. You know what I'm saying? Like, yeah. if, you know, if he strikes a little fear just being down there, dude, that's a win defensively. Just because it doesn't show up in the box score doesn't mean you weren't doing your job. So, yeah, I don't know. I'm not – I guess I didn't even notice the block numbers going down. So, I don't know. I still think he's killing it out there. Yeah, I mean, even if he averaged, like, let's say next season, like a block and a half, I'd be happy with that. Yeah. Because you're not gonna be blocking three, four shots a game. You're, you're just not. Because like t- just the 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 way you know the the guards are today, like you you really can't play defense. Like it, it's such an offensive driven league now that it's like defense isn't what it used to be. It, it's not what it used to be five years ago. Like you you can barely even stay in front of some uh, somebody. Like you you can say, oh, I went up and down, and they'll still call a foul if you get into their chest. Like it, it's hard to block shots in this league. 
Would you want them to bring hand checking back? No, I, I would rather them just let them play. Like, don't call the, the, the little ticky tack fouls. Don't let a player bully bully you into you know calling a foul. Like, just just let them play because I think the NBA is kind of turning into what the NFL used to be, where it wasn't fun to watch. Like, they call a foul or they call they want to review a play to see if it was flagrant or not. It's just, I would rather them just let them play basketball and don't call every little thing. Same. But the problem is, like, you know, if you're a ref, like, if you call one thing on somebody, you have to call that on. You Next time you see it, you have to call it. And it can make a bad game because I, I would hate to be a ref on, in, in the NBA because, you know, in back of my head, I'm like, that's really not typically a foul. But if I – and I would be thinking if I call that, I got to call that for the rest of the game. <laughs> that's what would suck. But um, I, I think they should bring hand checking back. I think they should give the defense something, not like where you're able to shove guys, but so just so you can keep a hand on the hip to keep guys in front of you. I always thought that added a level of challenge. And the other rules that they have let, they've you know taken away for defensive players. I think hand checking really wouldn't slow the game down that much. I think you'd still see high scoring numbers, but you would it would just be a little bit more difficult for these guys. I still think you would see a lot of points, though, being put up. I don't think hand checking changes that much defensively, but it gives the defense something else. Did you uh, see a lot of Warriors fans were really pissed that the Pistons had a five-second violation when they passed the ball in for the game winner? Was it a true five-second violation? It, it was, and the refs didn't call it. Oh, wow. Oh, I did not see that. And it was right after Clay Thompson hit that huge three. And then he was, like, all skipping, and then Sadiq hits it. And, like, I was just reading the comments, like, on Facebook, like, on uh, the NBA's Facebook page. Yeah. Bro, there are so many people, like, oh, about time someone shut that cocky motherfucker up. <laughs> I was like, damn, people hate Clay Thompson. Which is so weird. I don't hate Clay Thompson. I think he's kind of a cool, chill guy. I don't know why people hate him. Yeah, like I, I saw a Twitter video and they literally had it counting the five. Like the, it was like five and a half seconds by the time they got it did. And I was like, wow. Ah, but man, they, they, dude, I don't even know. Do they ever even call five second violations ever? Very rarely. Like, um, I think the other day I saw someone get a, uh, eight second violation because they didn't get it up to half court in time. Wow. In the NBA. Holy crap. I mean, they do let a lot of carries go and a lot of travel. So I'm yeah. not surprised they let a five second violation slip. <laughs> um, Let's get into this weekly game preview. We just have four games on the docket because I don't know, unless, unless you want to count this Sunday's game, do you want to count this Sunday's game? And then we won't talk about next Sunday's game. That's up to you. I really don't care. <laughs> Okay, well, I mean, this Sunday they're playing against the 76ers. Then on Tuesday they're playing against the 76ers. Yeah, I mean, that was supposed to be your national televised game. Which one was it? The one on Tuesday or the one on Sunday? Sunday. So, yeah, thank you. But that game was supposed to be played at, like, what, 8 o'clock at night, and now it's moved up to 3? Or 7. They flexed it to, like, I think an hour earlier or something like that. Oh, because the Tuesday game is played at 7. So I don't know which game it was, but either way, that was stupid. Still don't know why TNT did that to the Detroit Pistons. And I don't think we ever got an answer. Like, wh why isn't this being cleared up by TNT? Why do they just tell us we don't want to watch the Pistons? Because if I'm if I'm the NBA, you got some exciting players on the Pistons that you got Duran, you got Ivy, you got Killian Hayes playing well right now. Why would you not want to showcase these young guys to the rest of the basketball world. That's my question. I don't understand it. It just seems stupid and a miss for the NBA. You know, it's funny. They didn't announce it until after Killian punched Mo Wagner. Yeah. <laughs> like, I, I, it makes me think, like, if he didn't punch him or there wasn't an altercation, would they still have a nationally televised game? Because no one's really followed up on that. Exactly. And I thought it was, too. Like, as soon as they announced it, I'm like, was this because of the punch? Like, first of all, Killian used his right hand. We should be proud. <laughs> but, uh, <laughs> dude, I mean, I get it. If you, I guess if you don't want kids looking up to a basketball player that knocked, you know, stood up for himself, then you ESPN and all them shouldn't really be broadcasting MMA. You know, like I, uh, I saw the funniest nickname for him in my Instagram comment section. What is it? Killer B. Hayes. Oh, geez, that's awesome. Yeah. <laughs> 
I was like, bro, Killer B Hayes. Like, that's got to be his new nickname. Dude, um, geez, that is awesome. That is awesome. So, real quick, against the 76ers, two games, do you think they split them or do they win both or do they lose both? Man, like, when we played the 76ers a couple weeks ago, they played, like, a crappy game and they still beat us. Um, I think the 76ers beat us both times. What are the chances that Joel Embiid gets a technical because he gets bothered by Duran? Pretty slim. What about Isaiah Stewart? You think Isaiah Stewart gets under Joel Embiid's skin any of these games? No, I don't think so. I don't. <laughs> I, I just I feel like Isaiah Stewart, like he he only gets under people's skin when he plays really physical. And Joel Embiid's a physical center, and they're they're just gonna call fouls, like because they don't really just the way Joel Embiid plays, like if he's backing down and you touch him a little bit, that whistle is going to blow. Like he'll probably have 15 free throw attempts against the Pistons each game. God, I hate that. I hate yeah, that. it's just going to be so unwatchable because I, I just know they're just they're just going to drop it to him in the post and he's just going to live at the free throw line. Oh, okay. are you talking about Joel Embiid having 15 a game on his own or just the 76ers? Uh, just Joel Embiid on his own having 15. Dude, if he gets 30 free throw attempts between these two games, Anthony, I I, I don't know what I'll say to you. I don't know what I would <laughs> I mean, you know what's gonna happen. Like it's it's just how he plays. It's just it's I like him as a player, but to me it that's where the game kind of gets unwatchable. Like when you just blow your whistle like constantly. Yeah, I man, I do like I do respect Joel and B. I just don't like watching him play against the Pistons. That's it. Unless Luca Garz is defending him, because then it can get a little entertaining. Because then you got a guy that wants to be chippy with him. <laughs> I, that'd be awesome if they just brought Luka Garza back for one game to play against Joel Embiid. <laughs> He's on uh, the Timberwolves right now, actually. Yeah, I think he had 14 points his last game. That might have been a G League game, though. I don't know. No, that was uh, NBA minutes. They called him up. Yeah, but he got 14 points in, what, like eight minutes or something yeah, like that? because Cat's out. But, um, yeah, happy for Luka Garza. He's getting an opportunity in Minnesota. Yeah, well, it doesn't mean anything. He's still going overseas next year. Um, Jesus. <laughs> <laughs> There's one Luca Garza fan on, on my uh, YouTube channel. I know every every comment, he uh, he basically writes me a thesis about Luca Garza, so I'll probably get a thesis now because, of, right. his, because of that comment. <laughs> Speaking of Luca Garza, Timberwolves at Pistons. This is on Wednesday. This is a winnable game for the Pistons. Are we at home or – yeah, well, Timberwolves at Pistons. Okay, yeah. Um, I will give it to the Pistons. Um, I, I just think they contain Rudy Gobert. I don't know if Anthony Edwards back is better. Um, but I think it'll be a good game. The only player I'd be worried about is D'Angelo Russell. Going No, he's going to be locked up by Killian. There's no way. Two lefties going at it. We'll see. Yeah, um, I think this is a winnable game for the Pistons, too, just because, I mean, it's the Timberwolves. They just played Luka Garza, so there's a chance. Um, yeah, I'm going to take the Pistons in this one. Sure. So, so Friday night, we have Pelicans at the at the Pistons. What do you think? The, do you think the Pistons win this game? No. There's no Zion Williamson. They're still not going to win it. Man, you think the Pelicans are that good even without Zion? The way they're playing, yes. The the Pelicans are playing at a really high level. Even without Zion, they're a good basketball team. I mean, uh, Jose Alvarado, they're the preseason with us up for like 30 points. <laughs> yeah, he's not he's not going to do that again. This is a different Pistons team than it was at the beginning of the year. We got Killian playing. We got Killaby Hayes playing with confidence. Yeah, it, it's nothing against the Pistons. The Pelicans are just on a different level. I mean, Brandon Ingram. CJ McCollum, like they got good pieces. Jonas Valanciunas is, I believe, still down there too. So, I mean, that's going to be a nightmare. I thought Jonas Valanciunas played in Memphis. No, that's Stephen Adams. My bad. You're right. You're yeah. Right. I think they swapped. They traded yeah. centers. So, I'm going to go out on a limb and say the Pistons beat the Pelicans. I don't know how it's going to happen, but I'm going to say the Pistons beat the Pelicans. And then we'll just, for fun, Knicks at Pistons next Sunday. That's a winnable game. No. What? No, I, I, I can't see it. Knicks are just too fast. No, you're right. And 
It's not like I'm a Pistons fan, but like when I see the Knicks on the schedule, bro, I just cringe because I just see Jalen Brunson and the Knicks just running in transition and they'll have like probably 25 points off of turnovers just because the way they play. It's just, I want the Pistons to beat the Knicks. You have no idea, but it's just the way they play in transition. It's just, there's no way. Unless we have like a flawless game uh, from the perimeter. Like, we make, like, 15 threes. Maybe we can beat them. But, I mean, they're just such a good basketball team. So, your final record for the five games we went over, are you saying the Pistons will go one and four through those yeah. five games? Okay, yeah. I'm going to say they go two and three. Okay. I'll say, they, I'll say the Knicks win. I'll agree with you on that one because I do have Quentin Grimes on my fantasy team, and he's been playing lights out recently. Just the most random guy, too. Just dropping 18. It's incredible. So... Q and A. We got any questions? We do. I do have a couple saved. Um, we have one from Marvin. I don't know if he's still in the chat or not, but he did ask this earlier. Um, question for the panel: Is it me or does Marvin Bagley look like Greg Monroe? Ooh. Um. No, I would no. I mean, the only thing they have in common is they're both six eleven. They're both lefties. Marvin Bagley's a better athlete, and I think he's more fluid than uh, Greg Monroe. Greg Monroe was just – I loved Greg Monroe. He just was – I mean, man, he was like a notch above Luca Garza when it came to athletic ability. Like, he wasn't as stiff as Luca, but he was right there. So I don't really see the similarities. Uh, I could see where he's talking about, like, in terms of the post. Um, They're similar in the post, but I don't think they're the same player. I think Greg Monroe – um, wasn't is he's not as agile as Marvin Bagley, but Greg Monroe was like pushing two sixty. Marvin Bagley, I don't even think is two thirty. <laughs> like Greg Monroe was a big boy in the post. <laughs> yeah, he was very physical too. But Greg Monroe did have he did have a nice touch though. Like yeah, he, he had a great post game. Yeah, and I mean that is I do I guess I see that they're both good in the post, but Greg Monroe had more in the bag down low. Marvin Bagley, he loves to you know, roll off his right to his left and get that. Like, he definitely – he can play in the post, but he doesn't have the bag that Greg Monroe had. And Greg Monroe is just so much more physical than Marvin Bagley. Marvin Bagley definitely has a little bit more finesse to his game. Yeah, for sure. Mm -hmm. Uh, Yeah, uh, Brian was saying how, like, uh, Greg Monroe did have great footwork. He did. He had impeccable footwork. Um, I I remember – I don't even know why it just, just popped in my head. Remember Stephen A. Smith was like, oh, did the Pistons give Andre Drummond uh, the wrong max contract? They should have given it to Greg Monroe. Mm. When, when Andre Drummond wasn't able to like kind of like put up the same numbers. Yeah. I was just like, man, like I, I was just thinking of that era of basketball for a little bit. You know, <laughs> just like the Josh Smith, the Greg Monroe, <laughs> KCP, Brandon Jennings. Oh, dude, I loved KCP in Detroit, though. Um, I always thought, though, that if you had paired just Greg Monroe and Josh Smith together, I think it would have – I don't think it's – it's still not a great pairing, but I think it would have worked a lot better if Andre Drummond wasn't there. Because Greg Monroe, he was a solid passer, and I felt like if Josh Smith would give up the shooting and just start making cuts, you really could have had a great two-man game between those two. But it just never happened, man. There's just too many bigs in the post. Yeah, it's the Josh Smith era was definitely ugly. It was. It was. Yeah. It's just spacing, bro. It was terrible. Yeah, I mean, that that Pistons team in 2K was pretty money, though, because you could just shoot it with KCP and Jennings and just wait for Monroe and Drummond and Smith to get the rebounds and just kick it back out like a yeah. hundred times. I, I had so many people just quit because I got pissed. <laughs> Dude, what, man, my team in 2K, you want to know what my team in 2K was back in the day online? It was the Seattle Supersonics with Ray Allen and Richard Lewis. That was my squad, man. I would go off with those two. And Richard Lewis is actually a development coach now for the Pistons. So oh, yeah. That's pretty cool. Uh, we do have another question. This is another Bagley question. Um, Bagley and Boyan to the Suns for bridges and fillers. Would y'all do it? Oh, yeah, i will do that. I love Mikael Bridges. Um, I don't know if Phoenix does that. I think uh the yeah. Cam, I think the Cam Johnson for Bojan and you know, probably throwing in Jay Crowder, like Anthony said earlier in the podcast. That's probably a more realistic trade, but I would love Mikhail Bridges 
in Detroit. He is a hell of a player for Phoenix, man. I feel like that's one player that's untouchable for Phoenix. Oh, yeah. Like, Mikel Bridges, like, I doubt they would trade him. Like, they would have to get a whole lot. Uh, he's just – I think I saw a stat where he has started 354 games consecutively. Like, he yeah. hasn't missed a game. Like, he's the true Iron Man. Yep. Man, I love Mikael Bridges, man. Yeah. I, I don't – I would do it if it's on the table, but I doubt it is. Uh, I think more of a Camp Johnson and a uh, Jake Crowder would be more realistic. Dude, how stupid was Philly trading that guy for who did they get? Zaire Smith or whatever? Yeah. You know what's funny is his mom worked. She still does, I believe. She works in the Philly front office, and they had drafted him, and then they trade him like 30 seconds later. (laughs) Yeah, and I think he was originally from that area, and he yeah. played at Villanova. I mean, it was yeah. it's I mean, really stupid, dude. Jesus. Yeah, it's it's pretty crazy, man. Like those Villanova guys are really good. Yes, they are. Okay, we got a question from Bravo. Bravo's always in the chat. Shout out to Bravo. How do you guys feel about the Kate Killian future starters? Um, I like it, Kate Killian. Yeah, I, I mean, I love it. Are we putting Ivy in that starting lineup as well? I don't think so. I feel like when you say that, you know something, and that's just what's killing me. Um, no, I don't know anything. I would let you know. Yeah. <laughs> no, I. I mean, if it was just Killian and Cade, I do. I, I do like it, but I do still think that both those guys in the backcourt, it just—they're both giving up some great aspects of their games to make it work. So yeah. I would rather go Ivy in the starting lineup and bring Killian off the bench. I think you could do it, but you'd have to switch Kate the shooting guard and just like, 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 I know when we were kind of having like Killian Hayes talks when he was really struggling, and I told you if you put the ball in his hands, he'll be a good player. Yep. And we've kind of seen that, you know, he's gotten his confidence. I think if you put the ball in Killian's hands and just kind of have Cade, you know, play shooting guard, play off the ball, it could work. But we're going to have to wait and see because that is just such – it's a good problem to have because you have Jaden Ivey who says he's a shooting guard. Um, you have Killian Hayes who's a true point guard, a floor general. And you have Cade who can play point guard, but he's not really a point guard. He's a small forward that can just, you know, play one through three. So um, I think we will see next se- going into next season what the Pistons' plans are for Cade Cunningham. But like I said, great problem to have. Oh, absolutely. in. Yeah, I wouldn't mind Cade playing off the ball as long as he became, like, I mean, if his assist, if his assist numbers suffered, but his scoring went up and they started winning, I would not mind it at all. So, I just think, you know, when you play him and Killian together, especially with the way Killian's playing now, the only thing you're losing from Cade is a little bit of the playmaking. You know, that goes down a little bit because he's going to be asked to shoulder the scoring load a little bit more. But like you're saying, it's a great problem to have, so I'm not complaining. No, I I think. You have three great guards. I know I saw a question or not even a question. It was, it was a tweet from uh, my guy Zarek. And he said, if the Pistons were to land uh, the number two pick, would you trade the number two pick to Boston for Jalen Brown or the number two pick to Phoenix for Devin Booker? Yeah, I saw this and – um, I don't know, man. I, I'm still in the school of thought. If you get scoot, you don't trade him for anybody. Cause I mean, if, cause my, my thing is like, if Boston was willing to give up Jalen Brown for scoot Henderson, why would I want to give up scoot Henderson? If they're willing to give me a multiple time all-star same with Phoenix, if like Devin Booker really is on the table for scoot Henderson, scoot Henderson must be pretty special. But if I have to pick between the two, um, I'd, I'd probably go Jalen Brown just because it feels like Devin Booker really needs the ball in his hands. And we already have enough guys that need the ball in their hands. And Jalen Brown, he's such a good defender and playing off the ball. I would, I think he would just fit better. And I don't think he's too many notches below Devin Booker as an individual player. So I would go Jalen Brown just because I think the fit is better. And also he's a pretty damn good basketball player. Yeah. When I saw this, like uh, I love Zarek and I worked with him at Woodward, but Bro, like if I'm Boston and I'm Phoenix, I'm trying to win championships. I'm not trying to develop. Yeah. And I know Scoot Henderson is right up there with Victor Winabanya, but 
I'm not trading for a rookie. I'm I'm trying to win chips. Like yeah. both of those teams are not trading their, you know, what their star players for Victor. They're just not. Like if that's on the table, like like you said, you just draft him and figure it out later. You, you draft the best player available, and yeah. he would be the best player available too. But I do I do think it it's a pretty fun conversation, but realistically I just don't see that happening. Like if I'm Boston, I don't want Scoot Henderson. Like Boston would probably want Cade or something like that, you know. Like yeah. they, they don't, they don't want another rookie to develop. They're, they're trying to win. Yeah, I, I mean that topic has been coming up so much on people's shows that trading the number two. Oh, I'm just gonna say it again. If you if the Pistons land the number two overall pick, they're not trading that pick. I mean, it have to be a Godfather offer, but. Again, if someone's willing to give you a godfather offer for Scoot Henderson, he must be pretty freaking special. <laughs> you know, like, I mean, if teams are willing to mortgage their futures for Scoot Henderson, then you got to keep him because that says a lot about him as a player. Yeah, he, he he's a very good prospect. I, I think he, he's right up there um, with Victor. I think those, I, I've said it to you, they're 1A and 1B. Those are the two best players in the draft. Like, after after uh, two, or the, the draft will start at three. Yeah, because then that's when the talent kind of drops off. So you tell tell me if I'm wrong. I said this today to my boy Brooks when he came into the barber shop. I said that Scoot Henderson, if it wasn't for Victor Wenambanya, he would be number one in this draft class. But I also said he would have been number one in last year's draft class, and he probably would have been number one in the K draft class. Do you think I'm right or do you think I'm wrong? Scoot think, Henderson, we're talking I, Scoot. I, I think he would be number one. In la- uh, this this past year's draft class, I don't think he would have been number one in Cade's draft class. I, I think Cade is still a better prospect than Scoot. Mm. Um, not saying that he's he's not deserving. It's just I kind of favor Cade over Scoot just because mm. Cade's game is. I feel like it. Cade's game to me, I, I think he could play fifteen years in the NBA, just because it, it's not predicated on athleticism. Definitely. Um. But I do think Scoot to me would be number one if Victor wasn't in this this draft class. Um, I, I've told you he reminds me a lot of Baron Davis, and that's a big throwback uh, if you are like around my age, which is thirty, kind of showing my age. But um, I just see so much Baron Davis in his game that like he he's explosive. He can get to the cup. Uh, he can shoot. He's got a nice little mid range game. He's got the floater game and. Dude, he's built like a seven-year vet already, man. Like the kid is yoked. Like whoever gets him's getting a franchise guard. Like if, if he goes to Orlando, I'll be sick. Man, that would be crazy. Yeah, I'll be sick. <laughs> Dude, the yeah, the NBA need they needed a healthy Baron Davis. Like they needed a Baron Davis that took care of his body and could stay on the floor. That's what the NBA missed during the 2000s, and we didn't get that with Baron Davis. But we might get it with Scoot Henderson because it looks like he takes care of himself. Yeah. Um, like, there's a little bit of Derrick Rose in there. There's some Russell Westbrook. Like, he's just so athletic. So, would you think Scoot Henderson would have gone number one in the 2020 NBA draft? That was the one that Anthony Edwards went number one overall in. Oh, yeah, for sure. He's a better athlete than Anthony Edwards, and that's saying something. Yeah, so I had said that he – I went back to the 2020 NBA draft. I didn't do the 2019 NBA draft because, I don't know, Zion Williamson and John Moran. Where do you think Scoot Henderson falls in that draft? Do you think he goes number three if he's drafted with Zion and Ja in the 2019 class? Yeah. That's interesting. I don't know, man. I think I think he goes over Ja in that. Even though we know what Ja Moran has done, it's hard to look past those numbers. But I just think – I don't know, man. Scoot Henderson, he's a special guy. That's it's interesting though. Like, I think when you can go back and look at guys and like look at the classes, and be like, man, they might be number one in this one, this one, this one. You you might you have to keep them. You have to keep them. Yeah, it's gonna be interesting to see what does happen um in June. Yeah, it's in June. The COVID year like messed me all up because like the draft lottery was like in November. Yeah. <laughs> um, but yeah, that's that'll be fun to I'm I'm really anxious to see because we're we're sitting at two right now in the driver's seat, which I kind of want the Pistons to finish with the second worst record, not the first, because that first worst record, like you're screwed. You're getting the fifth pick. Oh jeez. 
Oh, my God. Where do you think, real quick, I, I know we're talking a lot about the draft, but where do you think Paolo Bancaro would go in this year's draft class? This year's? Yeah. Do you think he's a top three pick or a top Yeah, he, he's top three for sure. I think he would go third. Um, oh. Paolo's just so, he's just so polished, and he's so young. Like, it reminds me of uh, Blake when he was here in Detroit, like when he had that all-star campaign, like, that's how good he's playing as a rookie. Like he might get in as a rookie during the All Star game, and like they haven't had that since Blake Griffin. Like that, there hasn't been a rookie in the All Star game since Blake, and he his game is just so similar to Blake. He's not a explosive like dunking wise, but his game is just so polished already. Blake Griffin was an All Star his rookie year. I thought yeah. Yao Ming was the last one. No, it was Blake. What? I didn't even know that. That's crazy. Oh, yeah. he. Okay, yeah. Yeah, it was technically his rookie year. You're right. Wow. I did not know he was named an all-star. Wow, he was really popular, but Jesus. I yeah. forget that about Blake Griffin, man. Damn. Let's uh, get back to these questions real quick. Yeah, sorry, guys, for going off topic. <laughs> <laughs> um, You talk draft. I just salivate, but... <laughs> I got another question from Bravo. Do you see the Pistons trading away Killian Hayes while he's playing good and his value is higher right now? Um, man. I want to say yes, but but I think the reason I'm going to say no cuz I think it would be I think it would be wise. I'm all about trading guys when their value is the highest, but I think the Pistons want to see if Killian and Cade can make it work. So I'm going to have to say no. I don't think they trade him while his value is high right now. Yeah, same here. I think they hold on to him. I think Killian's value would be more valuable to the Pistons in the, the open trade market right now because I don't think a, a lot of teams would look at the tape of the first two years of him struggling. Yeah. And they, they don't really know if this is sustainable. But if it is, then, you know, Pistons got themselves a, a floor general. But I, I'd rather hold on to Killian, honestly. Yeah, I don't even know what you would – I mean, I mean, are we talking picks back for Killian? I don't know. I don't want those. I'd rather have Killian. Yeah, I mean, I'm good. I'd rather keep them. Uh, this is actually a Facebook question. This comes from uh, Brooks James Lee. Oh, what's up, Brooks? <laughs> Why not have Boyan come off the bench next year? He can play the two or three. Then you can have Ivy, Hayes, and Kate at the one, two, three. Oh, man. I I mean, yeah, I think Bojan, I don't know. It really depends on how they – it's hard for me to spe- say where – I would like Bojan off the bench because I think he has the game where he can thrive as a starter or off the bench. He can create his own shot. He can play with others. Yeah, it makes sense, but I don't know what they do with him next year. It's kind of hard to say. Maybe that is the choice. Maybe they go back to playing him at the four and Dern starts at the five and they bring Isaiah Stewart off the bench. I don't know, but I think Bojan off the bench – that makes a lot of sense because he could play the three or the four, probably even play the two depending on the lineup. And, yeah, you could play a, a Killian, Ivy, and Kate together at the one, two, and three. Yeah, I think when I look at it, um, I know I'm going back to the draft, but there's a world where if the Pistons win the lottery, uh, Victor went and Banya play small forward. Oh, yeah. And Stewart plays the four. And Durham plays the five. And you could have Boyan off the bench. But that's just like a dream scenario if that did happen. But, um, yeah, you could bring Boyan off the bench because Boyan right now is playing small forward. I mean, he's kind of – he's been like a fringe starter and he's had success off the bench. But, like I said, that's when you kind of get into just – I don't want to say craziness, but it kind of is crazy if you think about it because you could have – Hayes, Ivy, and Cade at the one, two, three. I know we talked about it on previous podcasts about that. Like, what do you do with it? Like, what if you do if you, you got Scoot? You got four guards. Like, you're, something something will happen. I don't know whether it's a trade or whether, you know, people just kind of get demoted on a bench roll. But I, I can't wait to see what happens this free agency because I know the Pistons are going to be extremely active. Yeah, I would say if Bojan's still on the team, though, um, next season, I think he does move to the bench. I think they eventually turn it over. I think you do see 
either Hayes, Ivy, and Cade start, or if they do land Victor, he's in the starting lineup. But either way, I think Bojan does come off the bench next year because his game fits. It makes sense to even bring him off the bench. So, yeah. Um, so it's funny. I was scrolling on Instagram before we went on the show and this other Piston uh, Instagram page I follow up, he had said that Michael Scotto said the Pistons are looking to trade Bojan for Cam Johnson and um, Jay Crowder. Now, I actually have talked to Michael Scotto a couple of times. Yeah. And I had texted him, but I haven't heard back. And I had I didn't see anything from Hoops Hype. So I'm assuming that the report is fake. Mm. But I, I do think there's interest there. Uh, I, I did want to like uh, answer Big Rich's question because um, he, he had asked about it. Have I heard about it? Yeah, I saw. I just don't know how legitimate it is. Like I said, I, I did text him, and I'll, I'll, I'll let you guys know if he does text me while we're live um, if that's an actual trade. But I don't even think that that was an actual trade. I think it was just kind of like a made up thing for Clout. So I mean, yeah, I don't know. I it's just. I don't see Troy Weaver calling Phoenix about Cam Johnson, but I also don't see Phoenix calling Detroit about, you know, Boyan. You know what I'm saying? Because I, I don't know. I, don't I mean, know. we had uh, James Edwards on a couple of weeks ago. And we, we asked about Cam Johnson. Yeah. For like a Sadiq trade. And he's like, they're literally the same player. It was just like, it's, he's like, it's literally the Spider-Man meme. <laughs> like they're, they're literally the same player. And I was just like, ah, you're, you're right. Yeah, oh, man. Cam Johnson just might be a little bit more consistent than Sadiq Bey. That might be the difference. So this is an interesting question, and I think I know my answer. I want to hear your answer. What's the deal with Noel? Do you think he's getting more minutes with Bagley out and the trade deadline approaching? Um, I don't think he gets more minutes with Bagley out. I think, if anything, they probably give some of those minutes to Kevin Knox. We haven't seen him. He's a big bodied forward that could probably that could play the four. We've seen it. Um, they joked around with him playing small ball five. But I don't think I just think Noel is firmly planted where he's sitting on the bench right now. I just don't see him getting any more minutes. Cause I think the thing that would hurt his value is giving him more minutes. Cause people already they're they're basing a trade around what he did for the New York the New York Knicks the last two seasons. Right? I mean, I don't know. I just don't see them playing. See, I think he's going to get playing time. And the only reason why I think he's going to get playing time is a GM's going to ask, I want you to put Noel in. I want to see what's there. Yeah, that that makes sense. But I don't know, man. I just think, you know, it, he's it might be like five minutes, you know, just to see like yeah. conditioning wise what's there. GMs will do that all the time. Like um, you'll, you'll see a bench player that hasn't played and be like, yeah, I want to see that guy play. You know, you know, put him in for a couple of minutes just to see what's there in garbage time. Um, I do think that's probably what's going to happen. I mean, Troy Weaver has tried to find a trade partner for him. Um, I think what the deal is, is he wasn't really promised any minutes. The Pistons told him, hey, like, you're going to have to earn your spot. And obviously he didn't earn his spot with, you know, Dern and Stewart and Bagley. Um, if they do trade him, it's probably going to be a, a package because he does make quite a bit of money. But if he doesn't get moved, the Pistons will probably buy him out like all the other veterans they've bought out since mm -hmm. Troy Weaver has been here. But does that make sense to have, like, you know, you already have films, so don't show him anything now because yeah, better? No, the, your, your point is, is smart. But I'm, I'm just saying, like, sometimes GMs will call and say, hey, I want you to play Nerlens Noel in garbage time before I do trade for him. Like, uh, remember when... We traded for Reggie Jackson. Oh, yeah. And, like, Reggie Jackson wasn't getting a whole lot of playing time. And then you saw him starting. And then all-star break, you saw him with the Detroit Bad Boys hat on. Mm -hmm. Like, GMs do that all the time where they're like, yeah, I want you to play this player. That's – oh, man. I guess I – yeah, I mean, I guess I could have guessed that something like that would happen. But it's it's different hearing it from someone that I know has – that I know has actually heard this from somebody else. So – yeah, it, GM, GMs do that all the time. Like it'll be like a fifteenth man. Like I'm interested in this player. I want you to play him. Like just to see like where he's at. 
if I actually want to trade for him or not. But mm. um, I, I wouldn't be surprised if you start seeing the well and cr- like this garbage time at the end of the quarter just to see uh, the teams that are interested in him to see like what they would actually offer. Yeah, I, I don't know. I just think some of those minutes go to Kevin Knox because we haven't seen him a lot recently. I don't think we have. Uh, yeah, I, I saw in the box where he played like five minutes the other night. So I was like, oh, that's interesting. Joshua, I watched a mean Thompson, some good, some bad, but very athletic. Just in case Pistons don't get a top two pick. What are who top two pick? Who are your th- uh, your three through five guys you like? Um, man, I really got to dive deeper into the draft, you know, and I will do that, you know, coming up here soon, but, uh, man, I'm kind of, I really like Cam Whitmore. I I love the versatile forwards, those guys that can, they're kind of like Swiss army knives. I like those guys. So he would be up there. Um, I mean, I do like Amin Thompson, even though I think he got cooked for 43 by Bronny James. Um, and, uh, I don't know. I'm not on the brand. I'm not on the Brandon Miller bandwagon yet. So, yeah, I'd probably say Amin Thompson, Cam Whitmore, and man, I'm blanking on another name. He's right on the tip of my tongue. Crap. Um, who's the guy for Baylor? We were talking about at the beginning of the year. I really liked his game too. As a two. Oh, uh, Keontae George. Yes, I really like Keontae George. So yeah, I was telling you about him. Like you like Benedict Mather and you like Keontae George. Yeah. So. I don't know if Keontae George would go three through five anymore. Like he, like it looked like he was kind of in that position at the beginning of the season. I haven't watched Baylor basketball up, you know, right now. So, but those would be my three guys. Those are guys that I've heard the most about. And, you know, I really like the guys from Villanova, man, that you can't go wrong with a guy like that. And I really like the way, you know, the Baylor bears play basketball. They all seem to have like that tenacity and that energy and that, you know, like what you want, they just have like some chip on their shoulder when they play. And I'm going back to Davion Mitchell, man. He still plays like he has to earn his spot, man. Yeah. Um, three through five. So I, I think if I'm, I'm assuming like obviously Scoot and uh, Victor, your one, two, which probably what's going to happen. I think you're going to see Nick Smith Jr. at three. Um, but I wouldn't want the Pistons to draft him. I, if the pit, let's say the Pistons fall at three, I think they look at Amin Thompson. Um, I think they consider Brandon Miller. I think they look at guys um, like a Keontae George, but I don't really think that they would take him at three. Maybe they try to trade trade into the draft again. Yeah. Um, but one guy that I've actually have fallen in love with lately is Anthony Black out of Arkansas. Mm. He plays in between the two, three. Kind of what the Pistons need right now are those wings. Um, but I wouldn't draft Anthony Black at two. I, if Trey Weaver can work his magic and trade into the late lottery again, um, I really love Keontae George, and I really like Anthony Black and Brandon Miller. I, I think Brandon Miller could go top five. Yeah, I just... Dude, he's given me... I know people love Jabari Smith, but he's kind of given me those vibes where... Great size for the position, but relies so much on his shooting, you know, and there's no, they have no, they have no taking it to the basket game, man. You know, you need that to be a high level pick in my opinion, man. Yeah. I, like, um, there's so much talent in this draft and that's what I was telling people last year. Like you think, you know, the Paolo Bancaro draft class was good. The Victor went Banya draft class is good. There, there's a lot of guards at the top, but I mean, um, I know a lot of Pistons fans like Brandon Miller, and I get it. The, the fit would be seamless next to Cade and Ivy. Um, Anthony Black, I, I think, to me, I think more Pistons fans are going to fall in love with him as we get closer to, like, June. Um, he just has such a great game, and I want you to watch some tape on him, Lance. I think you'll like his game a lot. Oh, definitely. I just, there was someone that had posted something about him on Twitter. I think he had a, there was a game he had. I want to say it was either... Jarvis Walker from Houston, or it was, um, wow, uh, Anthony Black. It was one of those two guys. Someone posted a video of them, and dude, they were they looked good. They looked really good. But I'm thinking it was man, it might have been Gigi Jackson out of South Carolina too. It's some guy. It's somebody that has like some decent height for their position. I saw a video of it, and I I gotta watch the game. I I bookmarked it. 
I'll have to go back and find it once we get off this, but yeah, yeah. for sure. Um, now I, I didn't put it in the prep, but I feel like we've talked about it a lot. Um, heavy heavy.com, which is, you know, a, a sports media site. They had posted that the Detroit Pistons and the Lakers would be interested in going after Draymond Green, not this summer, but next summer when he is an unrestricted free agent. Do you think that the Pistons would be interested in bringing Draymond Green to Detroit um, in 2025? Oh, man, that is – man, how old will he be by then? Let me see. Because I, like I said, we've talked about Draymond Green a few times, and that's like the second time that I've seen this like reporting that the Pistons, a lot of people in the Pistons front office like Draymond Green. Uh, so, oh, <laughs> Spot Tracks <laughs> showed me all of his technical files. Oh my gosh, how many does he have? Well, I just learned that now technical files are four thousand per tech. Oh wow, <laughs> jeez. Well, actually, they started at 2,000. Now he's up to 4,000. Jeez, man. <laughs> he got 4,000 against. So he got fined $8,000 against the Detroit Pistons. Wow. wow. Um, <sighs> Look at his contract, though. I don't even know why they. The technical policy thing is fucking hilarious, though. Jeez, what a woman. <laughs> Dude, I could just not imagine signing that away. Just signing a check to pay technical fouls. Um, yeah, I I like uh, I like Draymond Green. He'll be thirty four around when the Pistons, if the Pistons were to sign him, probably going into probably honestly going to be thirty five actually that same year. Uh, yeah, I just think I don't know what kind of player Draymond Green is going to be two years from now. You know, because yeah. he's, he's going there's going to be a drop off at some point in his athletic ability. But if you're talking about bringing him in just as a veteran, that's going to be on the bench, kind of be kind of a coach, going to be able to coach up these young guys. I'm all for it. So, yeah, I, I would like Draymond in Detroit. I think it'd be kind of a cool homecoming. I don't think he would get a lot of minutes in Detroit because, again, he's going to be 34 years old. Um, Yeah, I wouldn't mind it, though, because I, I think at that point, Draymond will have enough awareness about himself that he won't expect a big role with Detroit. Yeah, someone said, I'm good. I've already saw the Tracy McGrady tour. <laughs> um, I would have loved Draymond. Now this happened when Van Gundy was in for, uh, the front office. He actually tried to get Draymond when the Warriors won their first championship. Oh wow! Like, he tried going after Draymond Green and Al Horford, and the consolation prize was John Luer. Oh, damn, damn! I didn't know John Luer was that good. <laughs> He's not. <laughs> Shout to John Luer, but. I mean, a, a lot of to a lot of people's point. Like, I'd rather have Isaiah Stewart on this team. Like, if we didn't, they're like, if we didn't have Isaiah Stewart, then yeah. Um, like I said, the Pistons are notorious for you know signing veterans that are past their prime. I mean, we, we've seen it: the Chris Webbers, the T Max, the. Yeah. I think we even signed Elton Brand at one point. Like, <laughs> did we? Or, what? Not Elton Brand. I'm I'm thinking of someone else. It was a power forward that was way past this prime that used to be good. I, I can't remember, but I'd probably be out on it, though. Uh, yeah, I just, um, like I said, man, I, I think at that point, his career is probably going to be pretty much finished. But there's probably some knowledge he could put on some of the guys, I guess. So, I don't know. I guess I'm looking at it as he's just going to be a veteran. He's probably not going to play big minutes, not going to have a large role. And he's just going to be a guy that brings a ton of knowledge to the game and a high IQ. So, I wouldn't mind it. Yeah, I, I think that, uh, like I said, there, there's value in him just because he, he's he got that winning mentality. He's won championships. He he would probably expect a lot out of the, you know, the young Pistons, but he'd probably damage them. <laughs> like, honestly, like, um, a, a lot of, like, what he does, I think, is winning basketball. But a lot of Pistons fans are like, yeah, I don't want that. I don't know if there are, like, Michigan fans like you. Because they don't want any Sparties on their team, but <laughs> we kind of got to look past that once they enter professional sports, right? I don't know, man. Like I remember when uh, we drafted Isaiah Livers. There's so many because I'm followed by like a lot of like you know MSU alums. 
Like, oh, I don't want that scum Walmart Wolverines on my team. I was like, bro, calm the fuck down. Wow. Wow. The state fans are they get tri- they get triggered really. Even though they did beat Michigan today in basketball. Yeah, that was a uh, that was a weird game. I just listened to a little bit on the radio. I got so tired of that game. God. Michigan's I don't even want to say anything about Michigan. I'm so tired of them. Yeah, like I said, uh they missed John Beeline for sure. <sighs> Anthony, Anthony, what are you doing to me, man? <laughs> they do. I mean, come on. Jawan Howard is not a replacement. I really thought he'd – I got to give him more time. Got to give him more time. How much time does he need? I don't know. So, there's this – I was I was a huge fan of, like, West Virginia basketball when Beeline was there. Like, Kevin Pitsnoggle, um, I believe it was, like, James Michael Murray, too. He might have played for Marquette. I apologize if I got that wrong. But, anyways, when Beeline first signed with Michigan – my nephew was like, man, what do you think? You think there's a national championship in the future? I'm like, he'll get you to Sweet 16, and he will never make it any further. Damn, dude, I was wrong. And my nephew reminds me of that any chance he gets. I was so wrong about Beeline. Yeah. So I'm going to give Jawan Howard some time before I really say anything. I'm just saying, man, like he's had like the number one recruiting class. I think that this year was the number one recruiting class out of like all college basketball, and he still fucked it up. Still early, Anthony. <laughs> I don't know, man. It doesn't take that long to turn a program around, but hey, it's just me. <laughs> Dude, I would. Oh my gosh, you become a head coach then? <laughs> no, it's just you know the Pistons are going to trade in uh, Dwayne Casey and for Jawan Howard. No, I mean me and you should try to become coaches. <laughs> Be awesome. Oh hell no. I'd probably screw that up in two weeks. My friend just became a uh, oh man. I, he's so mean what someone said, but never mind. I won't even bring that up on here because he might listen to this. <laughs> <laughs> but we have any more Q and A questions? No, I don't think so. Um, it's just repetitive questions. Um, we could do one more just because this is just. I don't know. It's kind of a comical question. <laughs> Uh, do you think the Pistons are interested in Miles Bridges? Uh, I mean, what did Troy Weaver say? He goes after high character guys. So I'm going to go ahead and say no. <coughs> yeah, I mean, he did get reinstated uh, by Charlotte, but they're still trying to like work out legal trouble, obviously. Like, I was all on the Miles Bridges like before all the off-the-court stuff. Like, I thought we were getting Miles Bridges and DeAndre Ayton. Like, I thought that was going to be our offseason. <laughs> Uh, I, I, I like, I think Miles Bridges is a talented guy. I think he's a lot better playing with a point guard like LaMelo. I mean, Killian Hayes would probably make him look pretty good too, but it just, he has a good, he had a good thing going in Charlotte with LaMelo, man. He really did. I don't know if they were going to win a lot, but you know, they were winning enough to be in the playoffs or at least the play in. So yeah, I mean, look at them now. (laughs) Yeah. I, I just don't know if Miles Bridges on Detroit, you know, moves the needle in the wind column that much. So, and it's kind of redundant having like him, Sadiq, Boyan and everything. So I don't know, man. I I'm out on miles bridges, decent talent. I just think he's a lot better with a guy like LaMelo, you know, at the helm. Yeah. Like there's nothing against miles bridges. I think he's a really good player. I just think that I would have to hold off and see what happens with the legal trouble. Um, I, I, I think that I would be interested um, in him as a player because I think he brings a dynamic at that, you know, playing in between like that three and four, that's something that the Pistons, they don't really have that like hybrid, like small forward, power forward type on the team yeah. right now. But I can understand why Pistons fans would be interested in like Miles Bridges and because he, he's a really good player. Like him and LaMelo Ball are such a good one two combo. And you can tell LaMelo Ball has missed him a lot this year. Oh, yeah. No, I mean, he's fun. Like, I think he, uh, I, th- I mean, I just, I just don't know how he fits on this team. You know what I'm saying? Like, like I said, he just looks a lot better with a guy like LaMelo playing point guard. Yeah. Um, I don't know. It's just, he's a good player. It's just the off the court stuff that I kind yeah. of like struggle with. Like, if he comes to Detroit, will he have the like more distractions because he knows more people, you know, in Detroit? Like, I didn't know this until like uh, Soderbaby said it, 
But did you know Troy Weaver lived right across the street from Josh Jackson? Oh, no, I didn't know that. Oh, like while Josh Jackson was in Detroit? Yeah, like Troy Weaver, uh, Sada Baby tweeted out because he was really upset that uh, Josh Jackson got traded. He's like, Troy Weaver lived right across the street from Josh Jackson, didn't even tell him that he traded him. What? Wait, how did then? How did Josh Jackson find out? Like, I mean, that doesn't that doesn't make sense from Troy Weaver. He seems like a stand up guy where he would sit the guys down in his office and tell them what's going on. Well, I'm, exactly. But I do believe that Troy. I know Troy does live in the city, and I I would believe that Troy would buy a house purposely to watch Josh Jackson to make sure he doesn't do anything stupid. Oh, I'm not denying yeah. that part. I'm just denying like, it. Like, I was thinking in the back of my head, I was like, that's something that, like, Troy Weaver would do. Like, he would, like, just purposely like, just get, like, a condo across the street from Josh Jackson, making sure he's not throwing any wild parties or doing anything stupid. It would be funny if he just bought the house across from Josh Jackson, didn't live in it, just had a ring camera installed and kept an eye on him that way. <laughs> and then every time he's throwing a party or doing something, he just calls him. He's like, bro, how do you know? How do you know what I'm doing? No, I, I thought that was actually pretty interesting. Like, I, I had no idea that uh, Troy lived across the street from Josh Jackson. No, and I mean, could you imagine, though, after that trade goes down, Josh Jackson's just standing on his porch looking across the street. Troy Weaver never leaves his house. That's basically what Sada Baby was saying. <laughs> That's awesome. No, but uh, this was a really fun podcast. We had a lot of good topics, a lot of good questions. Um this channel has been growing like crazy. I don't, I don't know if you, you know, but we've gotten over a thousand subscribers in the last seven days. Oh wow! So That's we awesome. we just hit four thousand subscribers um, mm. on this channel. So we do appreciate all the new subscribers. We appreciate all the OGs like Marvin, Bravo, all the Ryans. There's like five Ryans in this chat. I, it's hard to keep them all straight. <laughs> Ryan one, Ryan two, Ryan three. No. <laughs> You guys are going to have to start, like, uploading the profile picture or something. It's hard to keep you guys straight. <laughs> That's awesome, man. No, but seriously, just like Anthony said, thank everybody for supporting this channel and supporting the podcast. You guys are awesome. Um, Just keep them coming every time we do this podcast, dropping the questions. It's a lot of fun for both of us, so we really do appreciate it. Yeah, for sure. Um, why don't you tell all the new listeners that are watching or, you know, the people that have been, you know, with this channel for the past two years where they can find the podcast and support it. Thank you guys for listening to the Pistons Talk podcast. Do us a favor. Go to Google, Apple, Spotify, or wherever you listen to podcasts and subscribe. After you subscribe, leave a review, drop a rating, but more importantly, tell a Pistons fan. See you guys next week. <laughs>